All righty. Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Ben Spohn, oral historian in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, during these history hangouts, we'd like to introduce you to some of the fascinating research being done using the historical collections at Hagley, uh, especially by folks who have made incredibly extensive use of those resources at Hagley. Uh, one such person joining me today is Al Chirella. Professor of History at Kennesaw State University in Kennesaw, Georgia, and author of what will be, by the end of this year, 2024, a trilogy on the history of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Today, we'll be talking specifically about the recently released middle volume of that trilogy, uh, The Age of Limits, 1917 through 1933. Hi, Al. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Thank you so much for having me on a Hagley Hangout. So I really appreciate that. Yes, we're excited to have you. Uh, we were excited to have you back in the fall for the author talk as well. So this is uh, hopefully a chance to reach an even broader audience than what we did back in the fall. Uh, so to get us started today, I think a, an interesting question or multiple interesting questions you can answer whichever one you'd like first is uh, A, that the very, the genesis of this trilogy was that it was going to be one book and also, uh, I'd like to know the origins of the title. How did you decide to call it The Age of Limits and uh, periodize this uh, the trilogy the way that you have? Okay, yeah, it's a great question. And I really started on this just about exactly now 21 years ago. It was in March of 2003 that I got an email uh, from a colleague of mine who's also been featured on a Hagley Hangout, Mark Rose. Um, and he was looking for somebody who might be interested in taking part in a book series at University of Pennsylvania Press uh, and to do a, um, and you may laugh when I say this, a reasonably short one volume history of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And um, perhaps naively, I said, I can, I can do that, no problem. Uh, and uh, agreed to do a one volume 200,000 word study of the entire history of what you know, even then I knew was the world's largest business corporation during the late 19th century. And I began the research and the writing and the more I researched and the more I wrote, it became clear that it was not gonna be a single volume history. I thought initially of two volumes and, and um, sort of pitched that at Penn Press as such. And they brought the first volume out uh, just about a decade ago. And then I was busily working away on the remainder of it and discovered that it was really going to be two further volumes, three in total. And for what I think were legitimate reasons, uh, Penn Press kind of preferred not to take on two additional volumes. Uh, and that's why I wound up with Indiana University Press. Um, and, and as far as the question of, of uh, for, a, for a series, by the way, that's going to be not 200,000 words, but in the end, pretty close to 1.7 million. And as far as the periodization is concerned, uh, the first volume goes from the company's founding in 1846, actually a bit before that, to talk about the origins of the main line of public works and so forth, uh, right up through 1917. And I think that was a really logical break because there were some things that were changing in the railroad industry uh, right around that time. Uh, and of course, it's when the United States becomes involved in World War I leads to federal control of the railroads, the United States Railroad Administration. Uh, and the, the, the second break in 1933, again, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, given that it's kind of the depths of the Great Depression, uh, it's the darkness before the, the dawn of the improved traffic patterns of World War II and the ultimate decline of the railroads. Uh, it's, a, it's a short cycle, 1917, 1933, there's a lot going on really in the 1920s um, that I talk about in detail. Um, the, the subtitle, The Age of Limits, uh, suggests that really right up through the progressive era, there was this sort of trope that suggested that railroad executives were robber barons, uh, which I think is a wildly inaccurate characterization uh, and not a very useful one, but that was sort of the public perception and by the 1920s, it's clear that because of 
economic changes, regulatory changes, the growth of highway competition, changing labor patterns, there are sharp limits on what Pennsylvania Railroad executives, these so-called robber barons, are able to accomplish. And that in turn is a prelude to volume three, which would be subtitled The Long Decline, uh, a, a subtitle I think is pretty self-explanatory as it leads to the Penn Central merger in 1968. So will you be ending on the merger or covering anything with the Penn Central period? Because I know that's barely over two years. Yeah, it's not long. Um, the Penn Central actually lasted until 1976 as, as a uh, company, albeit in bankruptcy, before its rail assets were conveyed to Conrail. Um, but it's, it's obviously not a happy story. Um, the last years of the Pennsylvania Railroad are not particularly happy either. And I debated whether to have a sort of postlude or an appendix or something that covered the story. And I decided not to for two reasons. One is it becomes extraordinarily complex. Uh, the history of the formation of, of uh, Conrail out of the wreckage of the Penn Central, the 3R and 4R acts, changes in regulatory policy, Staggers Act, I mean, all those things. And it just becomes then almost a, a book or at least a very long chapter in itself. And the other thing is, you know, I wanted to kind of end the book with the end of the railroad's history uh, on February 1st, 1968. So there is in volume three, a very short sort of prologue in which I basically look at very, very briefly uh, what happened between 1968 and the present so people who may not be familiar with that story are at least aware of what happened with Penn Central, with Conrail and so forth. But it, it's only a few pages um, because I just, I, I didn't want to devote the extra time, uh, the extra words to that, but also because I just thought it was fitting to just bring down the curtain uh, with the end of the railroad's existence. And if I could ask a little bit of a personal question about your own interest in railroads, since this ends with the combination of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central, and I guess the New York, New Haven, and Hartford, uh, were you, before you began this project, particularly interested in any one particular road? Because I know you're from Ohio, and Ohio had a very heavy presence in both of those railroads, the Central and the Pensy. Yes, it did. And as I mentioned in the kind of introduction to the first volume, I lived as a young child until about age six um, within half a block of a Pennsylvania Railroad branch line. Uh, although by the time I was kind of aware of it, it was now part of Penn Central. Uh, we then moved to a uh, apartment that overlooked what was at that time a Norfolk and Western line to Sandusky, Ohio, but it used to be part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And so that was my initial exposure. My first train ride was actually on the, the turbo train uh, from Columbus, Ohio to Pittsburgh uh, over the old panhandle of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, and so I, I, even though I didn't consider myself a, uh, you may be familiar with the phrase SPF, slobbering Penzi freak, uh, an SPF prior to embarking on this research project, I, I really do think that uh, some of our earliest childhood experiences kind of form and shape what we do many, many years later. So I'm not saying I was destined to write a history of the Pennsylvania Railroad, but I'm not surprised that it kind of wound up in my lap. Right. No, I, I, I can identify with that. Um... So for something I've been wanting to ask you also since uh, your author talk in November, and I know we're getting into a little bit of the prelude for volume two, but you'd said, uh, I thought interestingly and kind of provocatively that the Pensy's last good year was 1906. And I think it was, I mean, like any kind of statement like that, which you're right, it is provocative, is up for debate. 
there's certainly plenty of historians and rail fans out there who say, but look at what the Pennsylvania Railroad did, but look what all the railroads did during World War II. The enormous traffic that they handled, um, civilian passengers, military personnel, and so forth, the money they made. Um, and I say, yeah, but that was kind of their last hurrah and an event that sort of disguised these kind of more troubling longer term trends that had been uh, in the works really since the early 1900s. And what really happens in 1906 or thereabouts is that 1906 is the year in which Congress passed the Hepburn Act, which was arguably the first piece of federal legislation that was detrimental to the long-term success of the railroad industry. Uh, before that, yes, there's the 1887 Act to Regulate Commerce. Uh, there's the 1903 Elkins Anti-Rebating Act. Uh, and Alexander Cassatt, the, the president of Pennsylvania Railroad at the time, was a strong supporter of that. Uh, and in fact, lawyers from the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Santa Fe largely wrote the text of the Elkins Act before sort of handing it off to uh, people in Congress to, to debate, uh, which says a lot about the so-called capture theory of regulation. Um, but, but with the kind of progressive reformist sort of anti-monopolist impulses of the progressive era, uh, the, the 1906 Hepburn Act not only constrained railroads rate-making flexibility, but it also mandated a uniform accounting system that really bore no relationship to actual railroad expenditures and revenues and made it more difficult. And we could spend an entire hour talking about railroad accounting, but short story has made it more difficult for the railroads to attract additional investment capital. Uh, then the following year, uh, 1907, there was a short, but really very severe financial panic and recession. Uh, even to the point where, I mean, Cassad is dead by this point, but uh, even to the point where Pennsylvania Railroad executives are seriously asking, should we stop work on the New York improvements, Penn Station and all that? Um, and the decision was, we've invested so much in this already, we're committed, we have to keep going. But that was really the end of those kind of massive infrastructure projects uh, and then the recession, the lack of ability to attract capital, left the railroads vulnerable to service interruptions. Uh, that combined with winter weather, which nature plays a role, uh, in the early years of uh, World War I, resulted in pretty serious problems with service, which led to the USRA, which, I mean, it, it was a cascading series of events. So really after 1906 or thereabouts, there's not much good that happens to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, they, they do have some financial success in the late 1920s, but by and large, it's never the same company again. So I, I know I'm probably asking you to jump right into making a controversial statement, uh, but is there any... Uh, would it be fair to say or accurate to say at all that to some degree the long, slow decline of the railroads is self-authored then? Like any great disaster, and I think the collapse of Pennsylvania Railroad was a pretty great disaster, uh, there are usually multiple causes. And I think that, yes, there were a number of self-inflicted wounds, uh, and that would include everything from I'm not gonna say managerial incompetence because that I don't think was the case, but rather managers who were not necessarily thinking in terms of the railroad's long-term survival. It has to do with railroad labor and you know, fair is fair. They wanted the highest wages and best benefits they could get, um, but that contributed to the railroad's decline. But there are many other factors too. Uh, the regulatory process, changing technologies, um, highway transportation, you know, all those kind of things, there, it, multiple causality. But what I wanna emphasize is 
we often think that when something bad happens, like the collapse of the Pennsylvania Railroad, bankruptcy of Penn Central and so forth, that there must be a, a, an evil person involved or must be some mal uh, adapted actors, people who just are either incompetent or malicious. And I don't think that's the case. I think we have to grapple. I think this story of the decline of the Pennsylvania Railroad forces us to grapple with the idea that we can have a situation in which there are lots and lots of people who all get out of bed in the morning and say, I'm going to try my best to make things work well. And they do. But the collective result of that individual effort at competence is an unmitigated disaster. Uh, and so much of, especially in the aftermath of Penn Central bankruptcy, uh, there were journalists in particular who blamed, you know, Stuart Saunders was to blame, Alfred Perlman was to blame, David Bevan was to blame, the ICC was to blame, somebody was to blame. And perhaps they all were to some extent, but nobody ever got out of bed in the morning saying, I am going to take one of the most important railroads ever to operate on the face of the earth and bring it to its knees. Nobody wanted that to happen, yet that is exactly what did happen. Yes, I know we're presupposing ourselves here, but if you are willing to return to talk about volume three, I am sure we have a long conversation about uh, Bevan Perlman and, and the Saunders of it all. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson, uh, and Robert Kennedy, and, and a number of other people who were very much involved uh, in this whole process. Absolutely. Uh, but two ideas that I'd like to return to that keep us uh, on volume two is the uh, competition brought forth by the trucking industry. As, as I've delved into doing my own research on this topic, uh, that shows up much earlier than what one might stereotypically have expected as well as evolving labor. I know something that you'd said you wanted to talk about and that I think we should get to, uh, if now is the time, is the creation of railroad retirement and uh, you know the victories that labor was able to make during this general era. Okay, great. I, actually, if I could quibble, I think that's actually three questions and I'll take them each in turn. And I'll say right now that Yes, I, I agree that the uh, Railroad Retirement Act of 1934 and the whole railroad retirement system is a victory, is a win for labor, but it didn't really come about because of labor agitation for it. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Now, uh, to talk about the uh, motor carrier competition, uh, trucks mostly, buses a little bit, although buses were never as as deleterious toward the railroads as, as private automobiles were. Um, you may be aware that in the early years, in fact, while the late years of the 19th century, early years of the 20th century, Pennsylvania Railroad executives were strong supporters of the good roads movement. Um, certainly Alexander Cassatt was. Now, in fairness, Cassatt wanted good roads because he liked to go on carriage rides and everything. That was not exactly the same. But um, the, the rationale, of course, was to get farmers out of the mud. I mean, that was a, a kind of rallying cry of the Good Roads Movement. And the, the idea was that farmers needed better roads so they could get their produce uh, the 10 miles or so to the nearest rail line. And it was kind of inconceivable to anybody that roads would go everywhere and supplant rail service in a lot of cases. And what began to change that was World War I. Uh, trucks, of course, played an important role, primitive trucks, but nonetheless played an important role uh, in, in the conflict. Uh, and they trained a lot of people on how to drive trucks, how to maintain trucks, the potential of trucks, including W.W. W. Atterbury. Uh, who was at that time the vice president of operations, but he was kind of on loan to the American Expeditionary Forces uh, as director general of transportation. And when he was in Europe during World War I, his, he, he was, for one thing, freed of regulatory constraints. There was no Interstate Commerce Commission overseeing his activities. Uh, there were no kind of modal distinctions 
between trucks and ships and rail, uh, his mantra was, if it works, use it. And so he blended um, ocean going ships, channel steamers, canal boats, motor trucks, railroads, horses and wagons, whatever he needed to get stuff where it needed to go. And it, it, it brought about a, 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 in Atterbury a profound appreciation for the potential of intermodal transportation. Uh, and when he did become, even still as vice president in charge of operations and later as president, uh, he, he made it very clear that he supported uh, Pennsylvania Railroad investments in truck operations. And of course, he carefully scripted by Ivy Ledbetter Lee, his advisor to publicity, made it very clear that this was about delivering better service, modern service, efficient service, making sure that the Pennsylvania Railroad was a transportation company and not just a railroad. But it's very clear from internal correspondence, some of which is at the Hagley, that he was trying to basically undermine independent trucking firms. And again, we could spend an hour or more talking about the ways in which uh, he tried to do that with contract carriers and, and subsidiaries and all those kinds of things. But it, it's, it's very clear that he was using truck delivery, especially in areas like Philadelphia, New York, uh, to shave rates, to undercut the ICC mandated rate structure and offer what was tantamount to a rebate uh, in the form of free local delivery. And the ICC, particularly Commissioner Joseph Eastman, they figured that out very quickly. Um, and, and said, no, this, this is not something that can be done. Uh, it's a violation of federal law, and, and they curtailed truck delivery operations. Um, had that not happened, would the Pennsylvania Railroad have survived as a true kind of integrated multimodal transportation enterprise? I'm not sure that it would. Uh, even today, um, railroaders and truckers kind of have a hard time talking to each other. Uh, they, they really work in very different uh, fields of transportation. And so I think even absent regulatory restrictions, Pennsylvania Railroad would have found it difficult to integrate um, trucks into its rail centric operations. So does that, I mean, I can keep going, but I, I think since you mentioned the other topics as well, I'll uh, kind of break and talk about the labor issue. Well, but before we go into that, uh... You know, since I am most familiar with the 70s on and the era of bankruptcy and the formation of Conrail, uh, some of what you were saying about trucks and you know, truckers and railroaders operating in two very different ways, is this part of what builds that situation that we hit at mid-century where a lot of the Northeastern railroads that face that can face really stiff competition from trucking are in dire trouble while many more of the Western roads are, I, I guess, to put it in simplest terms, much more healthy. I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, there are multiple issues involved here and, and there are multiple problems afflicting the Northeastern railroads. Um, one of them is length of line haul. I mean, anybody who studies railway economics understands that the first mile and the last mile of rail service are by far the most expensive. Uh, and once the box car or the hopper car, whatever it is, is put on the train and it moves out of the yard, uh, railroads are extraordinarily efficient in moving those cars over long distances. But when it comes to actually spotting the car at the customer's loading dock, uh, that's where truckers have the advantage. Uh, and so Northeastern railroads, I mean, the Pennsylvania Railroad was was not the worst off. The New Haven was even worse shape in this regard. Um, but because they had a relatively uh, low line haul to origin destination ratio compared to Western lines, that was a problem. There's also the traffic mix. Um, Western carriers um, often haul bulk commodities, coal, lumber, you know, that kind of thing, grain. And so did the Pennsylvania Railroad. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the Pennsylvania Railroad was sort of less adaptable than New York Central, because the Pennsylvania Railroad specialized in commodities that are even today, 
essentially captive to the rails, coal, iron ore, things like that. Um, but smaller commodities, less than carload lot, uh, high value manufactured items, uh, those were especially vulnerable to truck competition uh, because trucks could offer faster service, more flexible service. They could dispatch uh, truck size lots instead of boxcar size lots. And you say, well, you know, it is what it is. The railroads can simply dispense with less than carload lot service. The problem is the rates are structured in such a way that less than carload lot traffic moves at very high rates and therefore cross subsidizes uh, bulk commodity rates that barely make a profit. And so without that high value traffic, the railroads like the PRR are in pretty serious trouble. I know you'd reference the New Haven as being particularly negatively impacted by that, but uh, to bring things closer to Philadelphia, if we look across the Schuylkill River at uh, sometimes competitor the Redding, is that what helps to do make, make things difficult for them since their main line run is the, I guess, the 90 miles from Pottsville to Philadelphia? Yeah, the Redding was certainly pretty badly affected as well. Um, it was when built, uh, we're getting fairly close to uh, 180 or so, 190 years since, since that line was constructed. Um, it was a superbly engineered uh, masterpiece, really. Uh, a, a steady downgrade from anthracite country to Port Redding in, in Philadelphia. And it was it was at the time uh, really the most profitable railroad in the world, uh, a conveyor belt to funnel anthracite to, to uh, the waterfront. But anthracite traffic really peaked about the time of World War One and has just declined precipitously after that. And without that anthracite traffic, the Reading just did not have the traffic base necessary to offset high terminal costs, short line hauls, all those kinds of things which is why the Reading was, was in even more serious trouble by the, the, uh, the 1960s and the Pennsylvania Railroad was. So for this period in the early 1900s, um, is destructive competition starting to become part of the, the, the limits here? Uh, you know, thinking about uh, while the Pennsylvania's own Schuylkill division that crisscrosses with uh, the Reading. There was not as much destructive or this is often called cutthroat competition as you might think, uh, probably less in the Northeast where there's really quite a lot of traffic than there is in some parts of the West. I mean, you can point to some Western railroads like the Pacific Extension and Milwaukee Road and say this is a classic example of overbuilding and, and uh, ruinous competition. Um, the line that you mentioned, the, the Pennsylvania Railroad's line that essentially paralleled the Reading uh, for its entire length was one of, if not the only, I think, unnecessary lines that the Pennsylvania Railroad ever constructed. Um, you know, it's a truism that the first railroad to go through an area gets the best alignment. And that was certainly true of the Reading. Um, and, and the Pennsylvania Railroad was never really a significant player in the anthracite coal trade certainly not the way the Reading was. Uh, and so, yeah, in hindsight, the Pennsylvania Railroad probably should not have built, built that extension on the Schuylkill Valley. Uh, other than that, I don't know that the, the, the PRR itself had a lot of unnecessary or, or overbuilt trackage. Other railroads probably did. Uh, I think the problem really is not so much this, this cutthroat competition or overbuilding. Uh, it's a situation that kind of gave rise to the Transportation Act of 1920, the Esch Cummings Act. And it dealt with a problem that railway economists and politicians have been kicking around really since the Progressive Era. And that was the weak road, strong road problem. Uh, and there were some companies, Pennsylvania Railroad, obviously, New York Central, a few others, that were very strong, well-capitalized, top-notch physical facilities, good traffic base, plenty of revenue, that sort of thing. Uh, and 
there were other companies, the Reading perhaps, but you know, also the Baltimore and Ohio, um, a number of other smaller regional carriers that just did not have as good, the Erie, uh, as good of a root structure. Um, they were burdened by excessive debt levels. They had trouble attracting capital and so forth, couldn't generate the traffic. Um, and you might think in sort of a 2024 kind of economic model that one of two things is going to happen. Either the weak carriers charge higher rates to rail bound local communities as a kind of penalty, if you like, for being you know, away from the major population centers like New York, Philadelphia, uh, or those weak railroads go out of business. I mean, you know, bankruptcy and failure is a fact of, of capitalism. Uh, but to the regulatory apparatus, neither one of those options is acceptable uh, because the Interstate Commerce Act, the Act to Regulate Commerce, makes it very clear that there have to be uniform rates in terms of service. So one railroad cannot charge more than another for essentially the same service, even if it's in an area with a geographic disadvantage. Uh, and bankruptcy and particularly the cessation of service is unthinkable. Um, prior to the proliferation of all weather highways, there are communities who are perhaps entirely dependent on the Erie. And if the Erie stops service, the community is essentially finished. Uh, and so the question then becomes how in the world is, is service going to be maintained, uh, maintain a parity of rates and so forth. Uh, and the solution, the Transportation Act of 1920, uh, is complicated, but it basically uh, says that railroads will set uniform rates high enough that even the weakest carriers can survive which is fine, except what it helps to do is to price the railroads out of the market for transportation services vis-a-vis -vis highway competition. Uh, and the other thing is this consolidation mandate, the notion that somehow the railroads could be consolidated into a number of self-sustaining systems of relatively equal earning power, which is the same thing as grouping uh, in, in British the British system when during the 1920s, most of the major carriers were put into four different uh, operating components. Uh, and, and so for much of the 1920s, railroad executives and the ICC uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, trying to play the consolidation game. And the end result is nothing. Uh, the end result is that no consolidation plan ever is implemented for a variety of reasons. So, so that, I think, is the really deleterious effect of, of this, again, not cutthroat competition, but rather imbalanced competition between the stronger carriers and the weaker carriers. And nobody seems to know what to do about it at this critical kind of transitional moment when highway transportation is seriously threatening to undermine the viability of railroads in general, but it is not yet robust enough to make up for the failure of specific weaker railroads. Um, maybe 20 years later, the answer or the, or the questions at least would have been different. So is that part of why there was no implemented solution in the 1920s uh, that there was a threat but not necessarily not yet a uh, fully existential threat well there, there's a kind of a common saying in military history that generals always fight the previous war uh, and i think regulators in the 1920s i mean they could see many of them were driving cars to and from work they could see trucks on the highways they could see the figures they knew that motor carriers were cutting into uh, the railroad's revenues. Um, but their mindset was really one of the progressive era. They were progressives, many of these regulators. That's what they, they came of age during the very late 19th, early 20th centuries. And they just couldn't conceptualize the railroads as being vulnerable entities. Uh, in fact, even through the 1950s and 60s, when there is a merger wave that culminates in Penn Central and so forth, um, 
there are politicians who are investigating the railroads as if the railroads were invincible, as if the railroads had uh, enormous pots of money squirreled away somewhere that nobody knew about, uh, and that therefore they could afford to maintain service, um, operate passenger trains, do all these other things. Uh, and it, it took really, I think, the better part of 50 years and the Penn Central bankruptcy before everybody, um, regulators, politicians, journalists, academics, uh, labor leaders, and even some railroad executives finally grasped the extraordinary vulnerability of the railroads. But at the 1920s, no, they, that, that was, was simply not in the conceptual framework of most people. That's interesting that that should be the case given well given what happens in the next 50 years you know bankruptcy is unthinkable till it's not yes and and remember that bankruptcy per se is not a huge problem most railroads did go bankrupt at some point pennsylvania railroad was a notable exception uh reading went bankrupt multiple times baltimore and ohio did i mean bankruptcy was was not exactly part of the court it wasn't rare either uh, and, and in fact, the bankruptcy code, Section 77, is written explicitly to deal with one class of bankruptcy, and that is railroad bankruptcy, um, a, 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 out of a realization that liquidation is the least preferable option, uh, given the need to maintain service. So, so for a long time, um, the legislature uh, and the courts had you know they'd come to grips with what to do when a railroad goes when a a railroad goes bankrupt what they hadn't really come to grips with is the kind of secular decline and ultimate failure of of a huge sector of the transportation economy so what logically uh comes next on our agenda for that today trying to to buoy that up uh you know the, the initial electrification or to have our our talk about labor uh a, a dozen follow-up questions later well let's talk about labor now if you don't mind um and and so again who are the villains uh in in this story and oftentimes labor is is labeled one of the villains because they you know demand um large crew sizes extensive wages fringe benefits um, short work days, you know, the, the whole panoply feather bedding, which is often called, although interestingly, and again, some of these records are in the Hagley archives, there are Pennsylvania railroad executives who said, yeah, I know it's useful that we, the industry through the Association of American Railroads is conducting a public relations, very successful, by the way, a public relations anti feather bedding campaign. Um, but, you know, between you and me, Feather bedding is not nearly as serious a problem as we're suggesting it is. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we do need to understand that, um, you know, then as now, railroad, exec, railroad uh, employees are hardworking, dedicated, uh, often well paid, but they earn every penny they get. So that was true in the 1950s and 60s, just as it is, is true today. Um, but um, I, I bring this up now because I talked about we've already talked about the transformative experience of World War I, um, the role of the United States Railroad Administration, which quite frankly did not do a great job at coordinating rail operations during the war. Uh, and by the way, lost a huge amount of money doing that, um, which was a situation that shaped future debates over either nationalization of the railroads or provision of government subsidies as a mechanism for protecting the railroad industry. But the most significant, I think, uh, accomplishment of the United States Railroad Administration was a transformative change in labor policies. Um, and we can talk, if there's time, if you're interested, about how that affected particular groups, including African Americans and women. But in terms of the larger labor force, um, the goal of the USRA was to maintain service, which of course requires people uh, in, and in 
an environment where there are steadily rising wages and pronounced labor shortages, getting people to staff the trains means giving them a lot in terms of wages and benefits. Um, even though Woodrow Wilson publicly said that he was trying to keep a lid on inflation, you know, obviously giving workers higher wages is going to contribute to an inflationary spiral. Uh, the fact is that rail labor was so important politically to Wilson's future as a politician that he, he, he thought it, should we say, expedient to acquiesce to railroad labor. And what that meant in practical terms was, uh, of course, higher wages, uh, better working conditions for shop workers. Uh, it meant moving away from the piece rate system to an hourly wage, which is something that shop workers had been supporting for a long time. Um, and, you know, all of this, and most important, was granting the right of workers to bargain collectively, which is something that had happened on the Pennsylvania Railroad with the so-called operating brotherhoods, that is, enginemen, firemen, conductors, brakemen, and so forth, but never with shop workers, never with maintenance of way employees. Um, those were considered by management and, and in the labor hierarchy, too, as kind of second-tier workers. Uh, and the USRA experience transformed that. Of course, in 1920, USRA control ends, um, corporate managers are back in charge, uh, a lot of the labor protections um, associated with the USRA go away, there's a post-war recession, uh, which makes the high wage rates unsustainable, uh, and efforts by, well, Atterbury in particular, but, but railroad executives in general, to kind of roll back the clock on the gains that organized labor made during the USRA years, that contributes to the Shopman strike of 1922, which is undoubtedly the most divisive labor conflict in the 20th century, at least, to involve the railroads. Um, and out of that, and, and Atterbury, by the way, takes a very hard line stance, crush the union, hire strike breakers, do what it takes, uh, never surrender, uh, compared to Daniel Willard at the Baltimore and Ohio, who's facing a, a different set of circumstances, who decides to be conciliatory uh, and compromise with, with organized labor. And, and even though Atterbury did succeed in breaking the strike in the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was Willard's approach to the Baltimore and Ohio uh, that kind of shaped labor policies from then on. Uh, and, and this notion that the railroads would buy labor peace through steadily increasing uh, wages and fringe benefits, which they could ultimately pass on uh, through higher rates. And at some point, actually fairly quickly, that method became counterproductive because it, again, helped price the railroads out of the market for transportation services. Um, now, in terms of your question about railroad retirement, the genesis for that goes all the way back to 1900, um, when the Pennsylvania Railroad introduces a pension plan which in itself was a kind of solution to problems associated with an earlier, as in 14 years earlier, um, protective association for, for railway employees, but it becomes, it's called the Voluntary uh, Relief Division. Uh, it, it becomes a full-blown pension plan in 1900. And by the late 20s, uh, that pension plan is experiencing serious problems. Uh, for one thing, Max Rebenak, who's the comptroller who set it up, was a very bright guy who did a lot of research, but he lacked any actuarial ability. He, he didn't know how. He wasn't. He, he didn't really consult actuarial tables. And even if he had, they wouldn't have done him any good, because railroad workers are different fundamentally from the general population. Um, for one thing, their, their, their jobs are much more hazardous and much more likely to be killed or injured than, than, than the, the population as a whole. Um, and what really caused the problems was during the 1920s, something that Rebenak and the others who set up the pension plan in 1900 never fully grappled with was the decline in railroad employment. 
So it's the same problem that's afflicting Social Security today. That is an increasing number of beneficiaries relative to a dwindling number of contributors. Uh, and it, it's a complicated process, but in the end, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad executives concluded that the pension plan, which was originally designed to maintain the loyalty of workers and um, provide a predictable level of pension benefits, was now constituting a serious drag on the company's finances. And the onset of the Great Depression made that unsustainable. And so the Pennsylvania Railroad was among the foremost companies trying to get the federal government to assume that burden. Uh, and the result of that was the Rare Retirement Act 1934. Um, and yes, it did benefit railroad labor, continues to do so. But in the initial stages of the negotiations for the development of that legislation, uh, many railroad unions were very strongly against um, some of the policy recommendations being made by the Pennsylvania Railroad. So it was a, it was a win for labor in the end. It was also a win for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, but it wasn't, strictly speaking, a labor initiative. It was as much a management initiative uh, as it was a labor initiative to have the federal government assume the pension responsibilities for railroad employees. So since we're on the the topic of labor um and i would like you to talk a little bit about like uh you mentioned made reference to african-american labor too uh but just trying to uh tie things into uh, what someone who's been following railroads in the news uh ever since last year might have caught wind of is you know this push uh by some to try to implement one-man crews uh what and since you'd already mentioned feather bedding, is there anything going on at this time where the railroads are successfully uh, cutting the size of crews? And I know some of the states that the Pennsylvania operates through, uh, boy, almost through the Conrail era, uh, Indiana has the law in the books that says you need a six-man crew. Yeah, and, and full crew laws were the bane of many railroads' existence uh, most of them date to the basically the progressive era, late 19th, early, really early 20th century, first decade of the 20th century. Um, and labor unions, rail labor unions, were very successful at billing these as safety measures at a time when, to be fair, there were a lot of railroad accidents. There was a spate of, of railroad accidents in the early 20th century, uh, although very few of those occurred because there were insufficient number of employees on duty. Uh, but it, but it was a very convenient for the labor unions to say if we had more employees, we have fewer accidents. Uh, of course, it was really a make work effort because you know, these these were train crews. These were these were individuals who would be brakemen and, and so forth who would then join the union. Um, and you're right; many of those laws remain in the books for many many decades. Um, two thoughts about that. First. Um, if we come back to the topic of African-American workers, um, the Pennsylvania Railroad and a number of other companies uh, hired uh, African-Americans as what they called was their term colored brakemen um, or colored trainmen. And these African-American employees fulfilled the requirements of the full crew law, uh, but given the racial hierarchy of the era, were paid considerably less than white employees uh, and could not join railroad unions. This is not a Pennsylvania Railroad policy, by the way. This is a brotherhood policy because all the brotherhoods, uh, Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, Engineman, uh, Order of Railway Conductors, and all of them, uh, they had very clear um, statements uh, in their, their charters that said, native born whites only. Uh, so that was a union decision, not a managerial one. Uh, and, and these African-American employees, these so-called colored trainmen, uh, did have jobs uh, because of the full crew laws. Uh, and 
we can talk if you want about how the USRA during World War I transformed their role. But to answer your other question about today, uh, I don't predict the future, by the way. It's very dangerous for anybody, particularly a historian, we have enough trouble understanding the past to try to predict the future. But um, you may be aware that because of some very serious acts were accidents, like the one in Chatsworth, California, and so on, uh, Congress mandated the installation of positive train control, um, which many railroad equipment suppliers and many members of Congress and so on uh, assumed or at least claimed was an off the shelf technology. It really was not. Uh, it took the railroads many years to bring that technology to uh, fruition and install it at a cost of you know, more or less $10 billion. Uh, and some railroad executives no doubt anticipated that the installation of positive train control might allow the use of one person crews um, because of all the safety overlays associated with PTC. Uh, and certainly there are a number of railroads, particularly in Europe, Japan, uh, Canada, uh, I think, that do Australia, that do operate with, with one person in the cab. Um, given what I think is a fairly substantial level of political hostility, or at least suspicion toward the railroads today, uh, especially in the aftermath of things like the East Palestine incident, um, I think it's politically difficult for the railroads today to you know, forcefully advocate for one person crews. Um, and, and if there's anything that full crew laws teach us from, from the early years of the 20th century uh, is that the number of employees that work on a railroad is as much determined by politics uh, and the actions of legislators as it is by safety considerations, operational considerations, that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll leave that there, but we'll see what happens. So I, I would like to hear about the, the USRA and the labor situation, but that also brings to mind, is there any... Uh, interesting uh conversation uh intellectual material to be had on the topic of evolving uh safety standards from that 17 to 33 period because i know we're predating ourselves but i was thinking of uh oh my automatic train stop right uh, pennsylvania had a system i think they implemented in the 1890s with a glass ball that would break yeah, and then it really came to fruition in the 1920s. Uh, the ICC mandated that that the major railroads install um, ATS on at least one uh, operating division. The Pennsylvania Railroad did. Uh, it was, was one of the leaders in, in the forefront of that. Um, and, and that mandate kind of emerged out of that spate of accidents in the early 20th century. Um, and, and PTC is in some respects uh, just a more sophisticated version of automatic train stop. Uh, that's actually something I discussed in volume one. And as you might expect, with a with a, such a large and complex multifaceted topic, it's hard to know whether to adopt a topical approach or a chronological approach. So some of the information about railroad technology, uh, automatic block signaling, and then of course, giving into ATS, uh, that was in volume one. So volume one, there are parts of it that extended past 1917. And you won't find much about that in volume two. Um, likewise, talking about steam locomotives, most of that's in volume three. Just to, to, so, um, but but in reality, in the nineteen twenties, American railroads were remarkably safe. Um, certainly compared to highway and, and uh, the very beginnings of air travel in the late twenties, early thirties. Uh, railroads are extraordinarily safe. So there's not a lot to talk about in the 1920s, um, mercifully, because there were not a lot of horrific accidents where there had been in years past. I feel like we've been kind of preoccupied with the, the struggles, but what, what else was good in the 1920s? Well, I, I see a lot of, I don't know if you call this a positive, a lot of unfulfilled potential. Uh, in the 1920s. 
Um, I, I see a lot of talented executives whose careers were cut short. Uh, Atterbury died um, fairly close to retirement, but still a, a little too soon, I think. And it's interesting to know what would have happened if he had lived uh, longer, if he'd stayed in office longer. And there were, by the way, shareholders who proposed that the mandatory retirement age of 70 be waived so he can continue in office. You know, would he have done a better job of, of dealing with motor carrier competition? Um, his publicist, uh, Ivy Ledbetter Lee, who, you know, so many of Atterbury's public statements were not actually his statements. They were what Lee wrote for him. Uh, so many of the initiatives that Atterbury introduced were in fact developed in collaboration with Lee. Uh, Lee died at a very young age uh, at about the same time, shortly before Atterbury did. Um, Atterbury's um, heir apparent, Elisha Lee, no relation, but same last name, um, he died prematurely. Um, bring into office eventually Martin Clement, who really nobody thought was destined for the presidency. So, you know, there, there, was, there was potential but potential that didn't quite come to fruition. Um, there was, I think in the 1930s in particular, the beginnings of a serious effort to grapple with the complexities of modality in the United States. Uh, the realization that land transportation involves highways as well as railroads. And again, what could have happened had that effort, had people like Joseph Eastman um, more forcefully advocated for legislation and regulatory policies that fully addressed the possibility of integrating various modes of transportation? You know, what might Congress have done? Um, but at least the, the people like Eastman started the conversation. Uh, at least there was an awareness of, of the need to address different modes of transportation. So I, I think in terms of, you know, yes, you can point to in the late 1920s and in, in the, the great bull market, Pennsylvania Railroad stock topped $100 a share. I mean, people were money making money hand over fist in the late 1920s. Um, in some ways, it's sort of the, the, the golden age of passenger service, even more so than the streamlined era after World War II. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but as I said, it's the age of limits. Um, the age of expansion is really over by the early, you know, with the opening of Penn Station in 1910. Uh, there are some th other things. Uh, you're certainly familiar. I'm sure you've been through it a number of times, 30th Street Station uh, in, 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 uh, Philadelphia, but that project, you know, that unfolds over a quarter of a century, um, from the very beginnings of efforts to replace Broad Street Station at the fine time it's finally demolished and, uh, the Filbert Street extension, so-called Chinese walls removed. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there, there are some positive developments, but, but no kind of spectacular achievements, uh, the way there is in say volume one. That's a, a disappointment to fans of Frank Furness, though. Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's a um and interestingly, you know, of course with Penn Station, and this was several years later, but with Penn Station, there was a huge rallying cry to, you know, polish it, don't demolish it, and and save the station. Uh nobody really seems to have cared about Broad Street. That's like, yeah, knock it down, relic of the past, cart it away. Uh, and, and nobody seems to have shed any tears over it. I mean, nostalgia, yes, but nostalgia and then good riddance. Yes, this quite often seems to be the case. Um, I, I think we should take a, a couple of minutes, and I regret not having brought it up earlier, uh, since you've made reference to uh, numerous references to W.W. W. Atterbury, and he was the sort of main character for your author talk in November. Can you say a bit about who he was? Um, he was a fascinating, complex, and controversial individual. Um, after his service in World War I, he insisted that people call him General Atterbury, which was his right. That was his military title, the Brigadier General. But that also tells you a lot about his personality. Um, you know, he was a no-nonsense person, 
who had risen through the ranks, uh, and I say risen through the ranks, I'm not going to say he started with nothing um, because he started with the Pennsylvania Railroad as a special apprentice, uh, which means a kind of management training program of sorts. He was recommended for the job by his older brother who knew Pennsylvania Railroad and Pullman Company executives. So he, he, he didn't like start out, you know, wielding a spike ball or something like that. Uh, but he did work his way up to the ranks. Um, he was an expert in particular in motive power. He helped sort out the congestion mess in, in Pittsburgh and in, in like 1903, 1904, which brought him to the attention of Cassatt and others who rapidly, unusually, right? Because the Pennsylvania Railroad was all about hierarchy, kind of like the military. Um, and advancement went through predictable, careful, carefully maintained channels and leapfrogging multiple levels in the executive hierarchy at, at one time just didn't happen, but it did with Atterbury. Uh, it really shook things up. Uh, and in terms of his personality, uh, you know, Atterbury, I think, didn't believe he knew he was right. Uh, he knew that what he said was right. And what that meant was there are only two ways to approach that. You could either agree with him and support him and cooperate with him, or you were his enemy. And he made a lot of enemies. Um, he and Joseph Eastman hated each other. Uh, I think really that's not too strong a word. Uh, he made a lot of enemies on the ICC. Uh, he perhaps didn't make enemies, but had strong disagreements with other railroad executives like Daniel Willard, Willard at the Baltimore and Ohio. Um, he was also an individual who had extraordinary strategic vision probably the first executive to realize uh, and his predecessor was Samuel Ray. Uh, and even though Ray is not as well known as Alexander Cassatt, it was really Ray who did the heavy lifting in the New York improvements in Penn Station. It was Ray who oversaw all the, the sort of under the street details with, with the tracks, the electrifications, the signals and so forth. Um, and even in the 1920s, Ray believed that the Pennsylvania Railroad should just keep building stuff. Um, and Atterbury very clearly understood, even as vice president in charge of operations, the number two person on the corporate ladder, that that was no longer the case. Uh, what was important in the 1920s was cost control, uh, diversification, and other forms of transportation, public relations, uh, government relations, which is where Ivy Lee came into the picture. Um, and he had to, even as Ray's subordinate, he had to kind of rein Atterbury in. I'm sorry, rein, uh, Atterbury had to rein uh, Ray in and say, you know, you can't keep building stuff. Uh, and this kind of hit um, a, a, a peak, I guess, shortly after Ray retired in 1925 and Atterbury became president. Um, Ray was one of the few Pennsylvania Railroad executives who didn't either die in office or drop dead very shortly after he left. He, he had a, a number of years of, of good health and, and he was working on a plan that was also tied into the consolidation arrangements in the 1920s to build what is sometimes, sometimes called the Sam Ray line, this, this kind of super railroad across Western Pennsylvania to um, bypass Pittsburgh, bypass, you know, to, to the grades and everything of the old main line, um, just the kind of railroad that would be useful today for hauling double stacks and things like that. And he would he would send, he would co there's correspondence with Atterbury and he would say, you know, here's what I want to do. And Atterbury would give him sort of polite, indulgent, non-committal replies and then send him off on his way because Atterbury understood that's not the way things worked anymore. So he was the first president who had that kind of new vision of what the Pennsylvania Railroad should look like, not as a company that built stuff, but rather as a company that controlled its operations, controlled its image, and, and so forth. Um, the interesting thing, though, is in spite of that strategic vision, in some cases, he was almost childlike in his adoration of certain things. 
um, like Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic. Uh, he was infatuated with Lindbergh. So were a lot of other Americans. And that more than anything else, I think, was what persuaded him to invest Pennsylvania Railroad's resources in transcontinental air transport and this, you know, short-lived hybrid uh, rail, air, transcontinental service and so forth. Um, and I, I, it made really very little financial sense. But I think it happened because Atterbury just, he thought planes were really cool. He thought that was a, just a, I mean, he was just, and, and it was, it was, you know, same thing was true with, with um, what might've happened with dieselization had Atterbury lived longer. Uh, would he have moved away from reliance on steam locomotives to dieselization? So, you know, he's a very complicated individual. Uh, very few people have lukewarm uh, opinions of him. People tend to either regard him as this extraordinary individual uh, or is the devil incarnate? There's not much kind of middle ground, really, uh, between the two extremes. And, and his forceful suppression of the Shopman strike in 1922, I think, contributed a lot to that. Do you think we should also have a bit of a sidebar on Ivy Ledbetter Lee? Yeah, he's a fascinating person. Um, and he... he um, like any good promoter, the person he promotes the most is himself. Uh, and, um, you know, he acted as if he was kind of the father of public relations, that he sort of invented this whole new um, field. Uh, he, of course, he contributed mightily to that. But he also shamelessly, uh, he was like Raymond Lowy, the industrial designer, uh, who never met a project he didn't want to take credit for, uh, including the GG1, which was really very little of that had to do with him. In any case, um, save that for line three. But um, Ivy Lee uh, first sort of came to the attention of the Pennsylvania Railroad um, because of a scandal involving the allocation of coal cars, insider dealing, that anyway. Um, he was involved in that. He was involved in the 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 cleanup work, not not physical, but public relations wise. After some railroad accidents, uh, including a very bad one outside Atlantic City, um, and very early on, even before World War One, he and Atterbury became quite close friends. I mean, they weren't they weren't just business associates. Um, uh, technically, Lee reported the president, who would have been first. James McRae, then Samuel Ray, and, and then Atterbury. But he always worked with Atterbury. Uh, uh, that, that was his contact. Uh, they agreed on a lot of things. Um, and that relationship deepened as a result of World War I and the immediate aftermath. Uh, one of the things the USRA did was it dispensed with all advertising and public relations activities as being a waste of money, uh, which means that Lee was kind of kicked out uh, unceremoniously and he was not happy about that right you know the government kind of wrecked his career um he also like Atterbury was deeply concerned about the Russian revolution and the spread of you know Bolshevism or political radicalism in, in any sort uh and they feared uh, and you can just imagine them sitting down talking about this um they feared that um Bolshevism was creeping into the United States, that perhaps not so-called responsible labor unions like the Brotherhood of Locomotive, Locomotive Engineers, but the shop workers unions and so forth, uh, which, by the way, um, the shop workers unions were a group of unions under the American Federation of Labor umbrella, and they were collectively known as the Railway Employees Department, R.E.D. Uh, that's enough to, like seriously disturb uh, a fervent anti-communist like like Atterbury or, or Lee for that matter. Um, and so they, they agreed that there was a serious problem here. Um, and they said a, a serious threat to capitalism, but also to democracy. Because if capitalism goes down, if, if economic freedom disappears, so does political freedom and personal freedom. Uh, and then we live in a bol Bolshevist totalitarian state. Um, and so clearly, um, Lee was a very strong defender of big business capitalism and the absolute prerogatives uh, 
of business executives to operate without government interference. But he wasn't strictly an apologist for, for business. Um, Lee believed, sincerely, I think, that it was his job to educate the American public about the glory of American business and the, the, the uh, extraordinary importance of American business executives. But he also believed, I think sincerely, that it was his job to persuade business executives to be responsible and do the right thing. And he carried that to really pathetic extremes uh, when he became hooked up with I.G. Farben in the early 1930s. Um, and he began saying some fairly complimentary things about the Nazi regime. And Joseph Goebbels, who was far better than Lee at public relations, as it turns out, uh, very quickly picked up on this and began passing Lee farther and farther up the Nazi food chain, right up to Hitler himself. Uh, and he was warned, right? Lee, in fairness, even his own son warned him to be careful. But Lee didn't listen. Lee honestly believed that he could persuade the Nazis to moderate some of their policies toward Jews and others. Uh, and talk about a public relations nightmare that, that wrecked his career and probably shortened his life as well. Um, and and uh, But for a while, um, he and Atterbury, you know, they had this, this very close kind of synergistic relationship. Uh, and, and at times when you look at sort of public statements that Atterbury makes, it's not at all clear who's actually making these, whether Atterbury is coming up with this or just a mouthpiece for what Lee is writing. And I think there's there's a lot of that, the, the latter going on. Interesting. Um, are there any other uh, points of interest within the book that you'd like to highlight, talk about, or is this a good chance to segue into talking about some of the sources that you found at Hagley that were hopefully of use? Well, I just, yeah. Um, let me say just a couple of words because I've touched on it tangentially about the role of women and African-Americans. Um, and their involvement in, in, in the whole railroad labor movement um, I already mentioned the issue of the so-called uh, colored trainmen and, and everything. Um, as in so many other ways, World War I, the United States Railroad Administration is transformative uh, in all of this. Uh, and the USRA issues um, under the auspices of Director General of Railways, William Gibbs McAdoo, who of course is Woodrow Wilson's son-in-law, and by the way, is Secretary of the Treasury while being Director General of the Railroads, um, issues a number of what are called uh, general orders uh, and then supplements to the general orders. It's it's quite a long list. Um, but the gist of it is that the USRA issued a general order uh, requiring the railroads to pay equal wages for individuals in the same classes of service, regardless of race or gender. Uh, and if one looks at that superficially, they might say this is a clear example of government advocacy for quality civil rights, nothing to be further from the truth. Um, the, the goal of, of, of and, we're, and we have to remember, of course, that Woodrow Wilson, the first Southern president since the Civil War, was an open racist, a, 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 an avowed segregationist and so on. Uh, and, and so there was not a lot about Woodrow Wilson that suggests racial tolerance or, or, or belief in equality. Um, so the U.S. area policies had almost nothing to do, well, nothing at all to do with racial equality. Uh, they simply were in recognition of the fact that, again, the U.S. area's goal was to keep the trains running. Uh, and that meant putting people on the railroads to work uh, and uh, a realization that during the war, African-Americans in the North, African-Americans who are moving North as part of the Great Migration had plenty of opportunities in shipyards, steel mills, munitions plants, you name it, uh, they were paying high wages. Uh, and in fact, the Pennsylvania Railroad had tremendous problems. They would send recruiters down 
uh, to places like Georgia and bring uh, entire train loads of African-Americans north, which is not easy to do because Southerners were determined to hold on to their labor force and they didn't want African-Americans to leave the South. Um, and then within a week or so, half the African-American workers they brought north would leave to work in a shipyard, uh, to work in a steel mill, whatever it is. Um, and, and so to kind of maintain employment levels, the OSRA was maintaining wage levels for African-Americans. Um, that's good at the time. But of course, what it also does is makes African-American workers and female workers vulnerable because there is no longer any economic incentive for railroads to employ low-wage Black or female labor if every worker is paid the same for the same class of work. Um, the other problem, of course, is it results in huge problems with labor unions um, who are determined not to allow African-American members. And even more so, after the war, uh, when the economy contracts, and white workers are determined to keep their jobs and essentially are saying African-American women workers are the first to go. Um, and ironically, perhaps, it's the railroad executives who are more invested in protecting the rights of African-American, in particular, workers um, than our white labor unions. Uh, if for no other reason than they feel a sense of obligation to employees who've served them faithfully and well during the war years. And it really does create a lot of tension and so on. And so it's this odd position that the government is supporting civil rights, but not because they support civil rights. The labor unions are undermining labor solidarity because of racial divisions. And corporate executives are supporting certain workers against other workers. Um, and it really is, a, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and in the end, railroad executives come up with a creative solution that appeals to unions as well, which is to become very creative with the phrase, you know, equal pay for equal categories of work by coming up with subtle variations in job classifications that ensure that a black worker and a white worker or a male worker and a female worker um, um, do essentially the same thing because their job description is slightly different. They get substantially different wages. Uh, if I might interject with the Hagley source and ask if you used it by any chance, we have a, it would be in, in volume three since it topically uh, deals with the World War II experience. But at Hagley, we have a small collection of Pennsylvania Railroad women workers from World War II who were basically doing the job of being a conductor on line serving, well, both the main line, that's to Paoli, and the line to Westchester. And yeah. they talk about their firsthand experiences uh, dealing with some of the situations that you described. Yeah, I, I have actually used that, and you're right, it is in volume three. Uh, these are individuals who are rather counterintuitively classified by the railroad as women trainmen. Um, but I mean, again, that that's that is the, the categorization that they found familiar uh, to just call them the female version of male trainmen uh, used on some of these services. Absolutely, and there and there is a. Uh, extensive correspondence file, both at the Hagley and at the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission in Harrisburg, uh, as executives are debating the terms under which these women are hired. Um, and, and there are, by the way, plenty of other women uh, who are working in railroad shops, uh, cleaning coaches, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was very clear that uh, the women trainmen, that is those who interacted with the public, um, both there and in stations as, as announcers and so forth, uh, they had to be of a, should we say, certain type, which meant white, certainly, uh, and at least some college education. Uh, and they were the ones that were put before the public, uh, in the public view. And the public responded very favorably, I think. Um, 
In fact, one commentator said he really appreciated that there were now female announcers working the PA system in Penn Station because he could now understand what they were saying, which was a change from when the men were making the announcements. Um, but I think the reason why this was all considered so acceptable was because it was made very clear that this was for the duration of the war. Uh, these were not permanent careers for women. Uh, and in fact, the rear ran a series of advertisements, including a famous one uh, titled Molly Pitcher 1944. Of course, it's a reference to Mary Hayes McCauley, uh, who allegedly uh, took over a cannon during the American Revolutionary War when her husband was wounded. Um, but obviously, Mary Hayes McCauley was not a professional soldier. She stepped in in an emergency. Uh, and so the implication is that these women are stepping in to do their patriotic duty during a time of crisis. And after the war is over, they won't be working for the railroad anymore. So. Yes, and, and a couple of the interviewees from that project had some very uh, hard feelings from being kicked out. Yeah, some did. I mean, you know, as you with anything else, I mean, it runs the gamut of of, of feelings. Some were outraged that they had done so such good work uh, and enjoyed it, and were well paid for it. Uh, and now we're being told that this would, would not they would not be allowed to remain in in, in place. Um, others, uh, I'm sure, did feel that they had done their patriotic duty and were ready to go on to something else. But yeah, uh, it was a it was a, a very interesting. Um, period in the Pennsylvania Railroad's labor history. But uh, also talking about Hagley, uh, I, I guess two things we should address with Hagley is, you know, we are not the only institution that has substantial holdings on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Ours uh, do a couple things better than others and, and vice versa as part of the whole uh, dispersion of that archive. So what was, what was uh, some of the most useful holdings that Hagley had in particular? For you, yeah. Um, one of the things uh, that I was very fortunate with in in tackling history of Pennsylvania Railroad uh, is that so much of the corporate records survive. Uh, relatively little, for example, the New York Central's corporate records are extant. Um, the downside, of course, is that means they have a lot more stuff to go through. But um, in fact, they're so extensive they were divided up among six different libraries and archives, and the two largest collections are at the Hagley where you are, uh, and uh, also at the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. So um, you know, I'll start with the PHMC first in Harrisburg. They have the, primarily, uh, uh, they have the presidential subject files. So uh, all the correspondence that went through the president's office, uh, letters the president received, copies of letters sent out, reports sent to the president and so forth uh, would generally be in there. Um, some of which involves high level policy decisions, but a lot of it involves simply mundanity. You know, thank you for your letter of complaint regarding our passenger service on this train and so forth, which clearly would not have been written by the president, right? They would have been written by one of his secretaries and sent out with, with his uh, signature on it. Um, one of the great things about the Hagley's collection is it kind of gets sort of one more level down in the organizational ladder uh, to a lot of the decisions that are being made, policy decisions, um, perhaps not decisions, but recommendations that are being sent up to the, the presidential level or to the board of directors. Um, so there's a lot of information there about specific projects, uh, whether that be uh, the Philadelphia Improvements, Chicago Union Station. Um, there's a recently acquired uh, collection on the Metro Liner service, which I think features prominently in volume three, that is not part of the Pennsylvania Railroad collection itself. Um, a lot of information pertaining to, to engineering matters and that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of matters relating to labor policy. Uh, there is an extensive sort of multi-multi-multi-volume uh, uh, labor chronology that details uh, the negotiations over many years uh, with every imaginable class of worker and labor union and that sort of thing. Um, so there, there is, there, there's a huge range of material um, to work from. And 
pretty much anybody who's doing railroad history, not just Pennsylvania Railroad, can find something in the Hagley's uh, collection that would be relevant to their area of inquiry. Yes, and uh, just as a for, for example, there's a, another episode of this series uh, with Benjamin Kletzer, who used the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, collections to talk about the Pensy's connections with the uh, railways in China. Yes, absolutely. And in other countries, and his specialty is in Chinese railway history, but uh, it's in other countries too, as you might expect. And what is interesting is that um, for a number of years, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the sort of self-proclaimed standard railroad of the world, uh, was indeed a kind of um, classroom laboratory for people from other parts of the world who wanted to see how the railroad operated, which is interesting because in a lot of ways, Pennsylvania Railroad was idiosyncratic, even in the American context, in terms of its traffic patterns, engineering standards, that kind of thing. So it, it was by no means standard, uh, but but it was large enough and successful enough for so many years to, to attract that. Uh, and um, in later years, um, after the Penn Central merger, uh, New York Central executives who consider themselves much more cutting edge and technologically and, and uh, organizationally innovative, uh, at one point referred to the PRR as a wooden real, wooden wheeled railroad, uh, which is kind of the antithesis of, of serving as a model for the rest of the world to emulate. I'll, I'll put a pin in that and ask you about that for volume three. <laughs> so from a human interest perspective, uh, was, were there any really standout things that you found that, you know, whether or not they made it into volume two, or uh, we can talk a bit about volume one, since it was quite some time since uh, that podcast happened. Um yeah, is there anything that stood out just as like, darn, that's an that's an interesting story, whether or not it made it to publication? Yeah, um, well, in 1.7 million words, there actually are quite a few of those, so I could go in uh, all the rest of the day. But but just to pick a few highlights in terms of kind of broader conceptual things that I really hadn't realized when I started this project was uh, the extraordinary interest by. Atterbury in particular in intermodality and in blending multiple modes of transportation and just how complex the story of trucks and containers too, which is another big part of the 1920s story. Um, aviation was kind of a tangential sideline, but just how important all that was. Um, I, I was fascinated by the topic of executive salaries. You know, we're all familiar in recent years, the Occupy Wall Street movement, criticism of the 1%, that kind of thing. Um, but in the 1920s, and again, as you might expect, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, there was a, a serious effort by Joseph Eastman and others to place limits on executive salaries. There's a huge PR war over this. Um, and it, it's it's um, striking how the debate over the level of executive salaries and what might be done to curtail them uh, paralleled what we are seeing in the early 21st century. So I found that fascinating. Um, the, the whole story of railway labor was more complex, especially involving women. Uh, people of color, African-Americans, uh, Mexican-Americans, um, much of which kind of is, is part of volume three as well as volume two. There are also a lot of, and this is not something I expected, but at, in writing this, it's a narrative history. It's not really an analysis. I don't have a thesis statement. I don't have a you know particular thing I'm trying to prove other than the Pennsylvania Railroad was an extraordinarily important part of the American transportation and economic system. Um, but I'm trying to 
make this come alive, and maybe this is a segue to a topic you mentioned earlier about the academic and the um, uh, sort of popular audiences, but trying to make the narrative come alive. Uh, and one of the best comments I received about volume two was it reads almost like a novel. Uh, and, and I was really flattered by that because I firmly believe um, that good history should be factually accurate based on sources, of course, and analytical, of course, but beyond that should be as close to literature as possible. And I'm not sure I've succeeded in writing a work of literature, but that's the aspirational goal. And so one of the things that helps a lot with that is to come up with stories. And sometimes you just get lucky. Um, you know, for example, uh, in, in volume one, uh, there's a story about uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Vice President in the 1850s, uh, William B. Foster Jr., uh, who is a relative of Stephen Foster, of my old Kentucky home fame. So it's always nice to throw that in because most people have kind of heard of Stephen Foster and so on. Um, but William Foster is uh, in the fall of 1859 leading a group of Pennsylvania Railroad personnel and their various assorted guests um, in a private railway car making a grand tour of the Pennsylvania Railroad system. It's kind of, you know, the culmination of the sort of pre-Civil War expansion phase. And they're making a loop out west and they're coming back. And then they're reporting that they're stuck uh, in Western Virginia in October of 1859. And then, I th and it took a moment for the penny to drop and they're like, oh my God, it's John Brown's raid. They were stuck there. They, they couldn't get through Harper's Ferry because John Brown had occupied the city. Um, and then they, in fact, went through the city eastbound the day after the raid had been crushed. Um, and, you know, that kind of brings home the sort of, it foreshadows the horror that's to come. And luckily, it's a kind of a narrative device one of the people on board that car, the, the, uh, the, the, the private car, was Stephen Foster's niece, Harriet Buchanan. Uh, and the name says it right there. Her other uncle was President Buchanan, the president who was being you know, reviled for his inability to bring kind of order to this chaos. And so, you know, you think about this 16-year-old this girl who is experiencing all this firsthand and the, the sort of notion that, you know, this is not just President Buchanan, this is Uncle James who's in this situation and everything. Um, and then later on in volume one, as I begin the last chapter of volume one, the New York improvements, or it was the last section rather of, of, of the last chapter of, of volume one, the New York improvements uh, sort of culminate with the opening of Hellgate Bridge um, linking Long Island to, to the mainland. Um, and that happens very early in the morning, like 1.30 a.m. on April 2nd, 1917, which is the same day that Woodrow Wilson stands before a joint session of Congress and asks for a declaration of war against the central powers. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's that, that just you get lucky to kind of bring together those individual personal stories, those stories that are kind of part of, of the Pennsylvania rare with these kind of larger sort of, you know, transcendent developments in American history that, that, that you know, that, that was not something, okay, it's not integral to the story, it's not integral to the grand analysis, but it was something that when I started writing this, embarked on the writing of this project, I never really expected to be able to include things like that to kind of, as you might think, spruce up the narrative. And they are wonderfully written books. Um, 
I think that answered just about everything I could have asked about how you balance out that type of writing and indeed how you approach writing a topic this large. Well, and I never had an outline. Now, I, I, I am a professor of history at Kennesaw State, and I teach a historical methods class, which is teaching students how to become historians. Uh, and I teach them, you know, kind of wagging my finger. It's like, you make sure that you have a thesis statement, a clear thesis statement. And before you start writing, you better have an outline. And then I tell them, you know, when I write my books, I don't have a thesis statement and I don't do an outline. Uh, and it's certainly true for, for the book. And when I started writing this 21 years ago, I had a conceptual idea of what, you know, I knew enough about the, the broad outlines of the Pennsylvania Railroad's history to kind of understand how I wanted to structure it. Um, but I never had an outline. And because I'm not using the Pennsylvania Railroad as an example of, say, technological change in America or, you know, transformative labor policies in America or something like that, I don't have an overall thesis statement to work with either. I'm just, I'm telling the story. Um, and that is something that I think most non-academic audiences value. They find familiar. They don't want a thesis statement. Historians do tend to want one. Uh, and so there, there are some challenges kind of appealing to both camps. But, you know, just as I said, I firmly believe that history should resemble literature uh, I also believe that as historians, uh, at least half, probably more than half of our readers should be outside the walls of academe. Um, because if they're not, we're missing a wonderful opportunity to interact with a much broader audience that is receptive to uh, what we have to say and the points we're trying to make. Uh, it's, not, it's not always easy. Um, and, you know, one anecdote about this is when volume one came out, uh, people asked me if there were illustrations in it. And I said, yeah, there are about 75 illustrations in it. And the historians I talked to said, wow, how did you get away with getting that many illustrations in your book? And the rail fans and so on that I talked to said, oh, that's it? Just 75? I was hoping there'd be a lot more. Uh, you know, that in kind of microcosm is, is, is what, but I'm, 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 you know, gratified that I think both groups have responded favorably to what I'm trying to do with, with volume one and two, and hopefully with volume three as well. Well, I thought of one more thing. Okay, uh, absolutely. If, if we could uh, personalize this approach in this interest is how do you modulate yourself as a historian with your own interest i assume in railroading um i'm going to assume in modeling because i think i'm seeing a nickel plate road mug with paint brushes in it yes uh and and i have a, an ancestor on my wife's side of the family who worked in the nickel plate shops and everything um work with steam locomotives quit and discussed when diesels came in uh, with a comment that I believe I'm quoting verbatim, I don't work on goddamn cars. Um, and that was, you know, which which it says a lot about the, the the difference in in technology and in work patterns. But yes, I have a model railroad. I'm sitting in my home office. There's a model railroad in the basement underneath me. Uh, and and so um, I sound a little bit like a snob, a little bit elitist, but I think that it can be somewhat dangerous for people who do not know a, a, at least something about railroads to write railroad history. Um, and I've, you know, read, and, and this is um, kind of made up, but it's not too far from the truth. Uh, people writing things like the breaker decoupled the cars before, you know, the train fled the station or something like that. Uh, and it's like, you clearly do not understand railroad technology at all. Uh, and, it, and it sometimes comes up in humorous ways. I, I wrote a book review of, of uh, a book, I think it was about uh, Eugene Debs, the, the uh, American Railway Union founder. And I mentioned that uh, in his earlier life, Eugene Debs had, you know, credentials as an employee because he worked as a locomotive fireman. And it came back from the copy editor 
saying that Eugene Debs had been a locomotive firefighter. And I'm all for like gender, gender neutral language, but fireman and firefighter aren't really the same thing. Uh, and and as, a, as an aside to that, when I, I, I sometimes assign articles on things like um, the, the so-called smoke nuisance during the progressive era, uh, a lot of which was, sorry, the fault of the railroads, uh, and and the, the the article mentions you know how locomotive firemen uh, are are being criticized for their firing practices and so forth. And I asked my students, you know, I, we were having a discussion actually uh, in, about this article, and I can see sort of my students are not really grasping what's going on. I said, wait a minute, do you all understand what a locomotive fireman is? They had no clue. Uh, railroads were so alien, have become so alien to the American kind of experience, uh, we really don't know much about how they work. So yeah, you do. This is a long answer to your question. Um, but but it is important to have at least a familiarity, I think, with railroad history. Um, by the same token, it's a challenge not to fall in love with your subject. Uh, and what I've written, I think, is essentially a biography, you know, not of George Patton or George Washington or somebody, but of a railroad company. And when anybody writes a biography of a person, I think it's only natural that you become so close to that person that you kind of adopt their way of thinking about the world. Uh, and that does tend to impede your ability to be rational and analytical. And so I've tried not to be an apologist for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, I've tried, I think the phrase is warts and all, to talk about, you know, so if somebody wants to read a raw, raw history of the Pennsylvania Railroad and everything that they did was brilliant, that's not what's in the books. Um, and, and so... I've tried not to be overly critical. Uh, I'm certainly not um, a Matthew Josephson, the guy who wrote the book, The Robber Barons. Um, I'm not trying to, to condemn the entire railroad industry, uh, nor am I an apologist for it, but, but it's, 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 it's difficult to find that balance sometimes. No, I, I can identify with that. I mean, I don't have anything over my shoulder, but I've got a, a book in front of me on uh modeling small scale layouts as i'm debating putting conrail on a coffee table uh and i i like that you should bring up that idea about it being hard to not fall in love with your subject because i know you know i do a lot of work on conrail right now with the oral histories but i have some pretty critical takes on the railroad it helps too, I think, to look at multiple perspectives because clearly uh, when I look at documents generated by executives, by railroad workers, by union leaders, by journalists, by politicians, by regulators, um, they're going to offer some starkly different perspectives on, on the propriety of, of certain policies. And so it helps to be able to kind of, you know, it, it gives me some, some, some guideposts to go by. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I yes, <laughs> I know that's only a one word answer, but I, I, that is something I've also been able to attest to in my own work. Um, is there anything else that we, you had on the list today that you'd hoped we'd talk about? Because I think that's a, a, a good narrative ending that we have achieved. I, I think it is. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, thank you very much for this. And, I hope we can talk again when volume three comes out, which should not be too much longer. It won't be 10 years, more like another six or seven months. So um, I, I believe me, nobody's looking forward to that more than I am. So, uh, Me too. I am looking forward to it a lot. I had to stop myself numerous times today knowing, well, there's more coming. There's more coming. Uh, I, I, I know we might not have kept to that as, as strictly as we could have, but we tried. And thank you for coming on today. And yes, we will definitely talk about volume three when that comes down the pike. And 
for our audience. If you'd like more Hagley History Hangouts and more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, find us online. You can visit us at hagley.org, H-A-G-L-E-Y.org. Thanks, and we'll see you in another two weeks.